Hello and welcome. This is a podcast about a project. I think it's an interesting project about Cambodia, art and artists, VR, and really the whole new media environment we're all living in and trying to figure out. I'm Tom Nickel, speaking to you right now from San Francisco, way out in the Sunset District, for those of you who know the city, almost to the ocean. I'm retired and all through working for someone else, but I'm not through working. I'll be going back to Phnom Penh very soon for the third time in about a year. I've been making 360-degree VR-style video with people there who work in cultural preservation and performing arts, just experimenting so far. I think it's almost time for my friends and colleagues at Cambodian Living Arts to start using VR and other new media to extend what they're doing. But what would be the approach? How can a small, independent organization use VR today to find new audiences and touch more people? I don't know, but I'm pretty sure the way to figure it out is to start doing something we can learn from. And I have an idea about what to start doing. So that's the project. I'm going to Phnom Penh to make a prototype of a new type of program for featuring artists using a new media package of VR, podcasting, video, and web publishing. Things are getting set up there right now. We'll interview, record, combine, produce. Look at it. Talk about it. Then I'll go away again for a while and we'll all reflect. That's the plan. I know it'll only sort of go that way. I'd like to try telling the story of what actually does happen as a daily podcast And maybe it'll just be me, a guy with a mic, recapping how the story did that day, and maybe it'll be over in a few weeks. But there's also some chance I'll be able to work other people into the podcast, at least some of the time. I hope so. And maybe it'll keep going. Maybe the project will clearly lead to something that will become the story. We should know in a matter of months, not years. Right now, in early 2018, VR is still in an early anything-is-possible phase. Small independents who do good work will have an easier time getting noticed than they will a few years from now. Of course, there's plenty of unknowns and lots of risks. It's the uncertainty that makes it an opportunity time. Big opportunity time. New media technologies like VR don't come around every day. I hope I can help Cambodian Living Arts do the right thing for themselves as an organization, whether it's becoming an early VR producer or not. The project, for now, is about producing a prototype. That's it. I'm not looking for anything out of this other than the fun of doing it. I have no career to advance, and there's zero monetary upside. I can't wait. My current idea is to produce two versions of the daily podcast. One will be an MP3 file that can be downloaded from a web page I'm setting up for this, so anyone who wants to can get it to their podcast player. I won't have a subscription service set up at first. The second version will be for streaming, also on the dedicated web page. What I'm planning to do instead of using a standard podcast media host is to run it from YouTube as a video, showing a few pics along with a soundtrack. This is episode one. So far, I've been working from a script that I wrote to make sure I got off to a decent start, I guess. Now I'm going to start to semi-wing it for a bit and see what happens. Semi means I have a few points written down on a piece of paper here, uh, some more ideas knocking around that didn't make the intro, and I'm not completely sure what I'll even say about them. First, I just should probably give a little bit more background on uh, the folks I'm going to be working with there, uh, the folks that I've gotten to know in the last few visits I've made, and that's Cambodian Living Arts uh, and their founder, Arn Chornpond. So there's many ways and many kind of starting points for this story, but uh, the one I'll use right now is, uh, you know, by way of background for those of you who aren't aware, there was uh, a horrible um, kind of civil war slash genocide uh, in Cambodia between 1975 and 1979. Part of the country became the uh, party, the, the kind of Maoist party known as the Khmer Rouge. They, you know, came from certain sections of Cambodia. Uh, they tended to be 
from the more rural areas, uh, the you know the more mountainous areas, uh, less educated, not the city people, uh, and they just overran the entire country and they emptied the cities, uh, emptied them out. Phnom Penh was the capital at that time, still is, and no one quite knows what the actual population was at the time that the Khmer Rouge emptied. Phnom Penh because refugees had been coming from the countryside into the city for quite some time. There could have been three or four million people there and every single one of them had to leave and start the long march out to the countryside where uh, the entire population was basically put to work for four years on large communal projects, dam building, mass rice farming, and numerous other projects that um, really came to nothing and ended up serving to kill about 20% of the population. There was political indoctrination uh, going on at all times, and the Khmer Rouge rulers believed that they were creating a new state, Angkor, uh, Anka, but it was kind of derived from the ancient Ankh or Wat, and you could say in some ways that the motto of Pol Pot, the leader of the Khmer Rouge, and the party in general was, you know, kind of make Cambodia great again. Uh, there was definitely uh, echoes of that. Uh, turn Cambodia into the rural, self-sufficient, rice-producing society that it had once been in the 1200s and before. I don't think anything ever like it has happened that I'm aware of, and uh, it only ended, although end is a relative term, uh, in 1979 when the uh, country to the uh, east of Cambodia, Vietnam, invaded. There had been all sorts of border agitation from the Khmer Rouge toward the Vietnamese. There were there was lots of provocations, all sorts of reasons to do this. So the North Vietnamese invaded Cambodia and drove the uh, Khmer Rouge, not completely out by any means, but out of, the, out of control of the country and into kind of marginal areas. Uh, but in fact, for the next 10 years, uh, between 1979 and, and the late 80s, the warfare between Khmer Rouge, you know, guerrillas really at this point, and North Vietnamese regulars who were occupying the country, it was ongoing also. So not only was there the four years of Khmer Rouge occupation, uh, brutal genocide, and I should also point out that the genocide partially came about because of the conditions of in these mass work camps, uh, the, the starvation conditions and the horrific hours that people worked in the tropical sun, but also particularly singled out uh, for killing were anyone who was educated and artists, artists and intellectuals. Uh, wearing glasses was sufficient proof that one might be an educated person and thus would just be killed. Uh, that's what the term the killing fields comes from. Actually, most of the people in the killing fields were members of the Khmer Rouge party themselves because like many, you know, kind of totalitarian, absolutist parties like this, the Khmer Rouge was always purging itself, always afraid of internal uh, dissent. The famous prison Tall Sleng, uh, S21 in Phnom Penh, that is now a, a public visitor center and museum of the genocide, Really, most of the people who were tortured and, and wrote confessions there were Khmer Rouge Party members, and they were sent, after they confessed and were tortured, to the killing fields south of Phnom Penh, where they were buried in mass graves and executed uh, in, um, in horrible uh, ways. But there were killing fields all over the country, and as I say, probably at 20%, maybe more of the population was killed. So that's the background. That happened. And it wasn't until the early 90s, 1992, I think, that the United Nations kind of stepped in and said, we've we got to stop this. We've got to have, you know, an end of the occupation. We, there, we'll supervise elections. There needs to be a democratically elected Cambodian government here. Uh, and so uh, that did happen. One could argue about how democratic it was and how Cambodian it was. The guy who won, Hun Sen, was kind of put there by the Vietnamese, uh, and he has ruled ever since, uh, by the way, as a increasingly autocratic uh, dictator in his own right in Cambodia. In any event, that did happen, and at some level, uh, conditions stabilized and got to, you know, livable conditions where people could return to the cities and make a life, and over the 
years now since really the end of the Khmer Rouge days and then once again the end of the North Vietnamese occupation, Cambodia has grown and done kind of well. It's kind of an emerging economy now. Uh, there's a, a garment industry there. Uh, they're, they're not you know, kicking butt in one of the real, uh, you know, kind of Southeast Asian powerhouses, but there is employment, they're starting to do okay, and there, there's a, you know, kind of a palpable sense of the country starting to wake up. There is a tech community there. There's co-working spaces, spaces where small tech startups uh, come and work together. In past years, outsiders, Westerners, would come to Cambodia almost exclusively to be you know, to be working for NGOs to help out, to help the country reconstruct itself. Now, Westerners and outsiders are coming to Cambodia looking for a cool job with a cool startup because that's one of the things, not the only thing, but that's one of the things that's happening uh, in Cambodia today. So another angle on the story where Cambodian living arts fits into that is that refugees got away uh, before the Khmer Rouge completely took over. Uh, it had been known they'd been, you know, fighting out of the countryside for years. And then after the first wave of the war ended in 1979, other refugees were able to get away, primarily to refugee camps in Thailand. One of the refugees that got away was 10 years old when the war started, so he was maybe 14, when he made it to a refugee camp in Thailand. Could have died thousands of times on the way, but didn't. Was adopted by uh, an American, Dr. Pond, who brought him back to Vermont. Miraculously, his health was restored. Uh, he finished all high school and, and college uh, in the United States, was an activist type and a charismatic type, wanted to help Cambodia, wanted to help Cambodian youth who were in the United States now, who had come there like he did as refugees, and, you know, we're having hard times of it, so he would organize youth activities and clubs, peace-oriented organizations. He just was one of these kind of nonstop guys driven to try to do the right thing. And for him, the most important thing to do, Arn Chornpond I'm talking about here, uh, the most important thing for Arn was because he had come from a musical family, because he'd been able to play music as a boy and maybe entertain the guards and be able to uh, kind of play some of the martial uh, patriotic music that they, the Khmer Rouge wanted uh, to be heard at all times. Uh, maybe that gave him a little bit more rice. Maybe that helped him survive. So he felt he owed his life to art and to music, to Cambodian music. And he wanted to give back. And what he wanted to do most of all was to find any of the masters of old Cambodian traditions, making musical instruments, playing musical instruments, singing, dancing, creating costumes, various kinds of painting and sculpture. He wanted to find any of these individuals, uh, men and women, because there were some who had disguised themselves as taxi cab drivers or garbage collectors and managed to uh, not be identified as artists and survived. And with the help of some hard-working, dedicated Americans, one of them a close personal friend of mine, a guy named Alan Morgan, who I'll uh, get to at another point in the story again, with some support from Americans, Arne went back to Cambodia in the 90s, found some of these few surviving artists, and was able to start to build uh, from scratch kind of a small network of little schools where the surviving masters could teach uh, what they still knew and could, and could practice uh, to young people so that the traditions could be maintained, so that the skills wouldn't completely die out. And th this, this wasn't easy. I mean, it, it was hard from every possible side. It was hard finding the masters. It was hard helping them uh, get to a point where they would even be able to uh, play and, and teach again. But surprisingly enough, even though there were young people who were interested in learning, to be able to create a situation where they could actually spend the time, where their parents would let them spend the time, where the idea of learning something about art instead of business and the important skills of making a living, it, in the end, you know, that was one of the most difficult challenges of all. But there were ways of overcoming them all. And years after years went by and the organization grew and matured and changes. People came, people went. Uh, but Arne, 
Arn Chornpod stayed constantly with it and saw... Now, in, you know, I'm recording this in the year 2018, and I believe Cambodian Living Arts probably even went through a few name changes, but is now about 15 years old as a nonprofit corporation. And it has offices in Phnom Penh and Siem Reap. They perform. There are several troops of young people that perform in magnificent traditional Cambodian costumes every night at the National Museum in Phnom Penh uh, for tourists and others who come to see. They have toured all over the world. They're quite well known, uh, have supporters all over the world. Their influence as a cultural restoration organization is starting to be uh, felt in other parts of Southeast Asia now as well. They're just an overwhelming success, a heartwarming, makes you feel so good you can almost cry success almost any way that you want to look at it. There are young people in Cambodia who had a dream of being performing artists and they've worked hard and now they are doing that with Cambodian living arts and making a living at it. It's just inspiring and remarkable. So they're continuing to grow. You know, what what's next for them? How will they start to make their influence uh, and the message that is in the stories they tell uh, felt worldwide? Well, I think that has something to do with new media. I think that they can tell the stories they tell almost completely in live performance now in song, in music, and uh, dance, and uh, traditional instruments. Um, I, I think that that can be extended in media, in 360 videos, in VR, in standard video, and in other ways. And I also am aware that Cambodian Living Arts is part of their organizational objectives, want to do more than just be Cambodian living arts. They want to support arts and Cambodian culture in general. They're not the only artists in Cambodia, and they're not the only network of artists in Cambodia, and they're aware of that, and they want to support everywhere that this is happening in their country because it's a good thing, because art is inherently a good thing to the extent that it allows human beings to express themselves, to express human values to be creative and particularly in a country with the recent past that Cambodia has sort of coming back to itself uh, looking at its traditions recalibrating who they are the, the self-expression and then the transformation of tears and and fears and, and and negativity into creativity and and innovation i, I think art is is central to uh, a positive kind of change uh, going on in that country now. And, and Cambodian Living Arts is, is really one of the big players in that dynamic. I think that some of the instincts that I have and skills that I've developed about media can help them extend their message. And so that's part of the backgrounder about them, part of what I'm hoping to be able to bring to them. And as I'm looking at my notes here, I've covered a lot of what I wanted to do in this more sort of freeform way. And there's so much more to say about Cambodian Living Arts, about ARN, and those will come out in some other of the podcasts also. But I'll just sort of do a little bit more in terms of my personal backstory, which is that I went to Cambodia for my first time. I've done a lot of traveling in Asia. Uh, I've been to China six, seven times. I've been to Vietnam, been to Malaysia several times. I um, hadn't been to Cambodia before. went there for my first time in February 2017, almost exactly a year ago now, with my friend Al Morgan, who was a college friend of mine. We were uh, in college together between 1966 and 1970. Uh, hunk of years that are really the heart of the 60s. Uh, we went through a lot of those changes and cultural uh, disruptions uh, together, uh, became very close, worked on uh, creating a nonprofit corporation to try to do good things in the world together after that. Uh, so we're you know pretty much longtime friends. And he was personally deeply involved in Cambodia's reemergence in the late 90s by being one of those big-hearted Americans, but being one of the main, one of the first big-hearted Americans who worked with Arne uh, Chornpond uh, to start to realize his crazy dream that actually did happen. Al hadn't been back to Cambodia for a bunch of years. He probably, I think he had about a five or six year window when he was going there frequently, right out there in, in much more difficult, hard scrapple times in Cambodia than, than we see now. The The country had not reemerged at that time as it has now. But Al was there during those, during those times. And um, we went back together and it was, uh, well, it was just 
you know, a great trip. He was able to reconnect with people and kind of get a level of respect and appreciation that it was long overdue and, and he got it and it just to be able to be there and be part of it is something I'll never forget. We traveled together, Al and I and Arne, and a friend of Arne's, uh, Deca, traveled around together in a van for over a week, starting in, in Siem Reap and went to Angkor Wat together, uh, went to Batambong, which is where Arne is from, uh, second biggest town uh, city in, in Cambodia. Had spent a couple of days there doing some amazing things. Arne knew all the great places to go. And meanwhile, all this time, I was doing 360 videos. One of the reasons I was going was I kind of wanted to take my 360 video that I had just started to get uh, interested and fascinated by to Cambodia and see what it would be like. And because it's so lightweight, it's easy to take around and and use. And then kind of with Arne running interference anywhere I wanted to go, temples, whatever. Oh, Arne Chorn Pond? Sure, bring the stuff right in. So by the time we got to Phnom Penh, I had actually done some pretty cool uh, recording, some of it with Cambodian Living Arts people up in uh, Siem Reap at their their office there, uh, kind of doing a rehearsal. And I made it all into a little uh, five or six minute story that showed CLA people, showed those same young people who had been performing, showed them in the village where they lived, living their regular old life there. And when you viewed these in the headset, even, you know, kind of, I'll say, prosumer level, uh, certainly not high-end 360 video, uh, but in a really $30, $40 headset as opposed to the five or $600 you know, high-end headset. Still, put that on and look at it, and it gives a feeling of immersion. You look all around. Every direction that you look is a village in Cambodia. That's, you feel you're there. It's, a, to me, just an extraordinary sense of presence. And so I was able to show that when we got to Phnom Penh and went to the main Cambodian Living Arts office. Al was, you know, introduced to everybody, and, and then I got to show the Cambodian Living Arts 360 video story that I'd made, which, you know, people really liked. The whole thing had just been, in some ways, a lark uh, for me. But now it was, you know, becoming something more than that because I started to learn more and more about Cambodian Living Arts. I saw their show. I I was kind of vetted by being Al's friend. So I, I entered at the top and got in pretty deep and met the chief executive officer and all the operating people and was, you know, really kind of in at the, the ground floor and was treated like a VIP right from the beginning. And I just, I fell in love with them and with what they were doing and what their role was in helping to build a new Cambodia. And the fact that they were kind of interested in the work I was doing, maybe there was a way I could make some contribution to their growth. So when I went home, uh, I thought more about it. And they actually, Plune Prim, the CEO, and Arne came to uh, the States came to Boston and other parts of the East Coast in the spring of later, I think it was May or June of 2017, and I met with them again and and told them, you know, I really thought that there was something in this new 360 video for Cambodian Living Arts. There was a kind of a kind of an intimacy that I thought would go really well with the kind of art they create, and also a, a newness that would help, you know, a smaller independent organization maybe get noticed and, you know, get some new people looking at the work they were doing. You know, how, how could we proceed with that? Well, you know, as any good CEO, Plune was really receptive and, and just saw all sorts of possibilities and was or was positive. Also careful, knowing that these things take time. You know, they already have a five-year plan, and it doesn't say uh, do Tom Nichols crazy 360 video stuff, you know, anywhere on that plan. So, you know, what do you do? He made a great suggestion, which was, first of all, get involved in something like VR it isn't a simple matter. There are other organizations in Phnom Penh that they work with. They're all kind of the same uh, developing kind of media ecology. He didn't say it that way. But what he wanted me to do was, he said, if you're planning on coming back anyway, as you say you want to do uh, in the fall, why don't you come, but talk to more people at at CLA, keep doing your work, showing us stuff, but meet other people too. Uh, Meet the Bopana Center, which is an audio-visual resource center. Uh, Find out about people in the tech community. So to get a little bit more background and then tell us what you think would be a good, reasonable plan for us to do to undertake to start getting involved with this stuff. I had planned on coming again in the fall. That was what I was hoping, and I wanted to stay for a while. I wanted to stay for as much as a month. You know, get an Airbnb, get a little apartment, have a place there, just do it. 
And the idea of going to Phnom Penh on my own for a month with as kind of as vague an objective as uh, learn more about the media infrastructure of Phnom Penh, a little unusual, but that's what I did. Plenty more stories to tell about that. All I'm going to say right now is that you know, Plune was really right. I met a lot of people. I met people in the tech community that didn't really know much about the art community. And I met people in the arts community that had absolutely no awareness of the emerging tech community there. So uh, I could see the silos. I could see how I could bridge things. Um, I could see how people could work together and, you know, create a little virtual reality community there without anybody having to do everything all by themselves. I started to formulate a plan. In fact, I got a really concrete idea of what would be a next thing that Cambodian Living Arts could do. That's the project I'm going back to do now, and you're pretty well caught up. Except for one thing I think I'll just add at the end here, which is that, as you can tell, Cambodia is playing, you know, a central role in this key little window of opportunity in my life, which is my early retirement years. Right now, I've got the energy, I've got the enthusiasm and drive. I'm not going to have all those things forever. I got the, 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 the wherewithal to apply some of the things that I wish I could have done my whole career if I only didn't have to spend so much time making a living. As I know it's not that simple, but, but this is a unique time, and this Cambodia project is being one of the main things that I'm applying my uh, considerable energies to uh, in this time, and I'm, I'm just loving it, just having a great time with it. So, you know, Cambodia is playing a, a really big role at a at a big personal juncture time for me. We'll just say the sort of the end of the employment years and the beginning of a new kind of involvement in the world. It's not the first time that Cambodia has been in that kind of a position. Khmer Rouge began in 1975, but you know, there are things that led up to that. Uh, Cambodia was not in a stable situation. Cambodia's next door neighbor is Vietnam. The entire Southeast Asian situation had been unstable for quite a while. The United States activity, obviously, was, was a big part of it. And um, it turns out that the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese regulars had been going up and down, north and south, just into Cambodia there to avoid any U.S. troops in, in the Vietnam part. And so and the United States just started bombing Cambodia, even though Cambodia wasn't part of the war. No one had declared war on Cambodia. Cambodia was supposed to be our ally. Their longtime boss, Sihanouk, had been kind of trying to be a neutralist and got more or less strong-armed out of there in the mid-60s by the U.S., replaced by a guy named Law Knoll, who then immediately bought a bunch of weapons from the U.S. that he started to use against the Khmer Rouge. In the long run, obviously, unsuccessfully, the Khmer Rouge won, Law Nall, the U.S.-backed regime lost. But uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't until 1969, actually, spring of 1969, that the fact that there was part of the war going on in Cambodia even came out into the public. The so-called secret bombing, Nixon was forced to finally acknowledge what had been going on. And that is what led to some of the most wide-scale almost out of control uh, marches and, and anti-war uh, activity in, in American history up to that time. That was what led to Kent State, the National Guard firing on uh, U.S. students protesting the secret bombing of Cambodia. So that spring is still called Cambodia Spring. The, it wasn't just things were kind of coming apart at the seams, it felt like, in the United States. It was all over the world. The Red Guards were at the absolute height of the frenzy of the Cultural Revolution. China, gigantic China, was just, no one even knew what was going on there. It was so insane. The secret bombing came out in the spring of 1970. I have been uh, freewheeling here, and I'd said 1969 several times what I meant was 1970 was Cambodia Spring, 1970 was Kent State, 1970 was the spring that I graduated from college. Al Morgan and I graduated from college. It should have been the time that we were, you know, trying to plan carefully about how we would kind of work our way into the existing institutions of society, but it looked like the existing institutions of society weren't going to be around all that much longer. Things were, were coming apart, and it just was crazy to go to grad school to try to kind of work myself into 
a system that was not going to be around all that much longer. I mean, it seemed like the revolution was any day now. It just sounds crazy to say that because the institutions of society turned out to be considerably more resilient than I saw at the time. But nevertheless, because of the secret bombing of Cambodia, because of Cambodia Spring, because of Cambodia, uh, my life took a turn that it wouldn't have taken. Uh, that is why Al and I and, and a couple other friends formed a nonprofit corporation. It was actually to try to convince cities and towns that they should take control of their own communications future and own their own cable TV systems. Eh, we didn't get that far with it, but nevertheless, we were trying to do something that we felt was progressive, and uh, we made it up from scratch on our own, and I kind of made my so-called career up uh, from scratch on my own um, from then on, and I attribute it all to Cambodia. And now I am back again thinking about Cambodia, about to go there again, Let's see how close, if at all, uh, the actual story resembles the story that I'm setting you up here to believe uh, is, is going to happen. I thank you again for your patience, anybody that's listened this far. I hope that uh, for whatever reasons you might choose to, that you decide to come back for more because I'm going to make more of these. I don't know what the audience is going to be, but I'm going to make them because I'm enjoying so far uh, making them. So thanks again and bye for now.